Good morning and welcome to Northwest Community Church. I'd like to have you with us again here this morning as we bring our hearts before God in worship. I look forward to spending the next hour with you uh, virtually, online, and uh, so we want to begin our time together by looking at God's Word. So if you have your Bibles, let's take our, uh, our Bibles and turn to Psalm chapter 25, and I want to read some of the verses from there. Oh Lord, I give my life to you. I trust in you, my God. Do not let me be disgraced or let my enemies rejoice in my defeat. No one who trusts in you will ever be disgraced, but disgrace comes to those who try to deceive others. Show me the right path, O Lord. Point out the road for me to follow. Lead me by your truth and teach me, for you are the God who saves me, and all day long I put my hope in you. Remember, O Lord, your compassion and your unfailing love, which you have shown from long ages past. Do not remember the rebellious sins of my youth. Remember me in the light of your unfailing love, for you are merciful, O Lord. The Lord is good and does what is right. He shows the proper path to those who go astray. He leads the humble in doing right. He teaches them his way. The Lord leads with unfailing love and faithfulness all of those who keep his covenant and obey his demands. For the honor of your name, O Lord, Forgive my many, many sins. Who are those who fear the Lord? He will show them the path they should choose. They will live in prosperity, and their children will inherit the land. The Lord is a friend to those who fear him. He teaches them his covenant. My eyes are always on the Lord, for he rescues me from the traps of my enemies. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for this opportunity to gather together again this morning and to worship you. Pray that you would uh, crack open the veil in heaven that we can see inside and see the glory of who you are. Uh, I pray, Father, that as we lift our hearts in worship before you today, that you would bless us and that you would inspire us and that we would be a, a blessing and an inspiration to you as well. And so we commit this time ahead of us into your hands, to your care and keeping. We look forward to connecting with you and to an intimate experience with you this morning. We love you, Lord. Thank you for inviting us to this place today. We pray in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen. My heart is filled with thankfulness to him who bore my pain, who plowed the death of my disgrace and gave me life again. Who crushed my curse of sinfulness and clothed me in his light and rolled the law of righteousness with power upon my heart. filled with thankfulness to him who walks beside, who floods my weaknesses with strength and causes fears to fly, whose every promise is enough for every step I take. Sustaining me with arms of love and crowning me with grace. My heart is filled with thankfulness to him who reigns above. Whose wisdom is my perfect peace, whose every thought is love. For every day I have on earth is 
is given by the King. So I will give my life, my all, to love and follow Him. And follow that leads the sinner home from death to life forever and sings the songs of righteousness by blood and not by merit your grace that reaches far and wide to every tribe and nation has called my heart to enter in the joy of your salvation by grace I am redeemed by grace I am restored of Christ my Lord. Your grace that I cannot explain, not by my earthly wisdom, the Prince of Life without a stain, was traded for this sinner. By grace I am redeemed, by grace I am restored, and now I freely walk into the arms of Christ my Lord. Let praise rise up and overflow, my song resound forever. For grace will see me welcomed home to walk beside my Savior. By grace I am redeemed, by grace I am restored. of Christ my Lord. By grace I am redeemed, by grace I am restored, and now I freely walk into the arms of Christ my Good morning, everyone. Would you join with me in prayer this morning? Father, we just thank you for today, and we thank you for each day that you give us. We thank you for all the blessings that we enjoy, and they are perhaps at this time more evident to us than uh, that, uh, and, uh, at other times, Lord. And I thank you for the way that you have uh, shown your protection and your hand upon uh, us as a congregation, upon our uh, community, even upon our province and our country, Lord, and and uh, that we haven't had uh, the devastating effects from COVID that so many places have had. And I pray that as things begin to open up, Lord, that uh, once again your protection would be felt and that we wouldn't experience this second wave that is uh, so much uh, in the news. And uh, pray that uh, that might not just be the case here in Canada, but uh, worldwide, Lord, that as things open up a bit, that uh, 
uh, that uh, people would remain cautious and follow uh, precautions. And Lord, we thank you that uh, we are able as a church to begin services again, and we're looking forward to um, this next Sunday when that happens. And I just pray that you would help us to get all of the things in order that need to be done, and that even as we uh, meet somewhat differently and with a little uh, more precautions in place, Lord, that that wouldn't detract from the uh, the worship itself and that uh, as people gather together, they might um, feel your presence and might feel the fellowship of uh, other believers and might truly be able to worship and show their adoration to you. And for those who are unable to be there, Lord, we just pray too that you would uh, bless them and encourage them and continue to be with them and and um, may others uh, be able to connect with them and fellowship with them in different ways and uh, let them know how much loved and needed they are as part of our our body Lord for those who may be feeling uh, certain health issues and dealing with uh, medical things Lord we pray that you would be with them that your healing touch would be upon them for others uh, touched in different ways uh, perhaps through uh, this pandemic lord whether it be financially or by job loss or whatever lord that uh, you would be with them as well and meet their needs and meet their needs through the body and i pray for us as a body that uh, our eyes would be sharper than usual that we might be more attentive to the needs around us and use the things that you have uh, given us to be a blessing to others. Thank you for this time, Lord, and thank you for this service. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to be reading from Daniel chapter 7 this morning. Daniel chapter 7, verses 9 to 14. And I'll be reading from the New American Standard Bible, uh, starting at verse 9 of Daniel chapter 7. I kept looking until thrones were set up, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His vesture was like white snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was ablaze with flames, its wheels were a burning fire. A river of fire was flowing and coming out from before him. Thousands upon thousands were attending him, and myriads upon myriads were standing before him. The court sat and the books were opened. Then I kept looking because of the sound of the boastful words which the horn was speaking. I kept looking until the beast was slain and its body was destroyed and given to the burning fire. As for the rest of the beasts, their dominion was taken away, but an extension of life was granted to them for an appointed period of time. I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man, was coming, and he came up to the Ancient of Days, and was presented before him, and to him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom, that all the peoples, nations, and men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away and his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. Well, let's take our Bibles and turn to the book of Daniel today, chapter 7. We're going to read from verses 9 to 14 as we talk a little bit about the rugged manliness of Jesus Christ. The Son of God and the Son of Man was a man's man. Now, Somewhere in the Gospels, we read that Jesus asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? That's a loaded question. And I'm not sure I'd have the courage to invite the public to evaluate me like that. Now, it happens as a pastor. We, we know that. We get evaluated. It comes with the territory. Some churches demand a yearly evaluation of their pastors. Others don't. Either way, a pastor knows he's going to be evaluated, and it can be really painful sometimes because we aren't perfect, and that can irritate some people, and we'll hear about it. But who in their right mind goes around asking for people outside of their intimate circle to evaluate them? Well, Jesus did. 
Who do people say that I am? And he opened himself up to a world of hurt. Well, Master, some people think you're an idiot. I've heard you're a troublemaker. Yeah, well, I heard that you're a glutton and a wine-bibber. I heard somebody the other day saying you're a friend of traitors and you hang out with the worst of sinners. I mean, they could have said all of those things, and some people were saying those things about Jesus, and Jesus was wide open to hearing all of this. Why? Because he was a man's man. Someone who had courage and confidence and a powerful sense of what his purpose in life was. Which is such a stark contrast to some of the paintings that we see about him, don't you think? You know those ones, Jesus, meek and mild, long, flowing, almost girly hair, soft and sensitive, almost effeminate in his natural graces. Not that there's anything wrong with those things. We love those things in our women. But it's certainly not the kind of a man that's going to inspire you to go into battle with him. He looks like a bit of a weakling who'd never harm a fly. But it's a misrepresentation of who Jesus is. The Bible, as you read through the Gospels and as you read through the New Testament, and you even read the Old Testament prophets, pictures Jesus as someone who is brave and rugged and adventurous and passionate. And from the early age of 12 in the temple until the day he returned there with a whip and some angry words, you could see that Jesus is brave, courageous, passionate, adventurous. I remember the dialogue from The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. It was probably my favorite book when I was a kid. And I remember when Susan is about to meet King Aslan, the real Lion King, King Aslan. And she's a little bit nervous about it. After all, he's a huge lion. And she asks the beaver, is he safe? I feel rather nervous about meeting a lion. And the beaver answers, safe? Who said anything about safe? Of course he's not safe. But he's good, and he's the king. I want to talk to the, today about the rugged, almost startling manliness of Jesus Christ. A man of power, a man of courage, a man of adventure, a man who is willing to risk. Is he safe? Who said anything about safe? Of course he's not safe. But he's good, and he's the king of kings. You know, when I was a new dad, I had a year and a half where I did the Mr. Mum thing while my wife was working as a nurse doing rotating shifts. We had three little kids, and sometimes I'd take them to the local playground to work off all their energy. And sometimes, not always, but sometimes I would see mothers there who were doing everything they could to keep their little boys safe and gentle and kind. They weren't allowed to climb the monkey bars. They weren't allowed to fight and wrestle with each other. They were always supposed to use their manners and share with everybody, which are good things, of course. But let's not take away the adventure and the ruggedness of little boys. Because little boys, just like grown men, are wired differently than females. Rugged adventure is a part of being a man. Fighting for dominance is part of being male. Wrestling and climbing and falling out of trees, that's all part of the male spirit. Being loud and fidgety and teasing girls, that's part of what it's like to be a male. Is he safe? Who said anything about being safe? Of course he's not safe. But he's good. And he's in charge of things. Jesus is the king. And that's how we need to train our men. Yes, we need to train them to be good and to be honorable and kind and compassionate and gentle sometimes. But we also need to teach them to be tough and rugged and adventurous and passionate because that's also what it's like to be a man. Dangerous and energetic and courageous and good. But not always safe. And Jesus was the perfect example of that. He was a man's man. He was a guy that was willing to take risks. But he was always good. And we're going to look at that today. 
Let's, let's pray first. Father in heaven, I thank you so much for this opportunity to look at your word again and to look specifically at Jesus. We thank you for giving us the perfect son of God and also the perfect son of man. Jesus, as the second Adam, is everything that you wanted the first Adam to be and everything you've wanted every male that you've ever created to be. He's the perfect representation of you and the perfect representation of man. And Lord Jesus, we thank you that you lived that out to the fullest and that you were perfect in doing that and you modeled it to us. And I pray, Father, that as we look at this today, that you would inspire us as men, especially to follow hard after this model of Jesus, what he shows us about being a godly, passionate man's man. Guide us as we look at your word again today, I pray. And I pray it in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. So the Bible calls Jesus the Son of God and the Son of Man. That means that he re represented God and men perfectly. So perfect, in fact, that the disciples couldn't find any flaws in him. Now think about this for a minute. The more time people spend with you, the more time people spend with me, the more they're going to discover our flaws. No, I'm not a perfect pastor. No, I'm not a perfect husband. No, I'm not a perfect father or a perfect friend. You don't have to look very hard to find a mounting list of faults in me. But after spending three years with Jesus in all kinds of situations, the disciples couldn't find a single flaw. In the Gospels, they said he was perfect in every way. He was tempted in everything, just like everybody and yet was without sin. He was the perfect son of God and the perfect model of a man. And it's interesting that Daniel foresaw that way back in the Old Testament. So let's go back to Daniel chapter 7, and I want us to read verses 13 and 14 to begin with. God had given Daniel a vision. <clears throat> and in this vision, in verse 13, he says, As my vision continued that night, I saw someone like the son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. And he approached the Ancient One and was led into his presence. He was given authority and honor and sovereignty over all the nations of the world so that people of every race and nation and language would obey him. His rule is eternal. It will never end. His kingdom will never be destroyed. Safe? Who said anything about being safe? Jesus was a man's man in every sense of the word. And if you follow Jesus, he's going to take you on a rugged adventure. He is going to take you neck deep into storms. He's going to bump you right up against hostile crowds. He's going to allow you sometimes to be picked on by the devil and assaulted by hatred and temptation. He might scold you sometimes. He will certainly encourage you. And he will always challenge you to be the best version of of who God created you to be, to grow in your righteousness and in your godliness. Safe? Who said anything about being safe? But he's powerful, and he's good, and he's definitely the king of kings. So let's take a few minutes to look at this. Daniel says he's a man of enormous power. Now, that's something that most men are very intrigued about. It's why men are so competitive. It's why sports is such a big part of a man's world. It's why we climb the corporate ladder. It's why we always have to control the remote. We like power. But if you aren't good and you aren't compassionate, then all of that power will make you selfish and despicable and very, very unsafe for other people. Just ask any female that's been around for a while. Far too many women have experienced a man's power without any goodness. And they've been crippled and scarred for life as a result of it. Which is why they work so hard to teach little boys to be good and kind. Important, important part of being a man. And this is what makes Jesus so unusual. He sits with the woman at the well. He, he deals with the, the adulterous woman that the religious thugs had hauled before him. And he deals very differently with them than other guys have done. 
You know, guys, Jesus is going to try to teach us to be real men. How to be both powerful and good in a way that makes women and children feel safe and secure in our presence instead of terrified. To him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom so that all people, groups, nations, and languages will serve him. Safe? No, he's not always safe. Sometimes he takes us on some pretty raw adventures, but he's always good. And he, we are always secure in his mercy and his love and his unending faithfulness. Secondly, the Son of Man, Daniel says, was totally courageous. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save the lost. Now, don't think for a minute that Jesus didn't know what he was wading into. Sometimes it made him sweat buckets. Just think of those courageous firefighters on 9-11 who knew that the risks were really high as they began climbing those stairs in those towers. But they did it because they had signed up for the call. A man's man is willing to step into danger, not foolishly, because not every situation requires risk and danger, but a man's man will step into the unknown if he feels the call upon him, especially if it's a call that he has heard from God. And that was the character of Jesus, and it's the character of every godly man. He came to seek and to save the lost. He waded neck deep into danger, and he faced it over and over and over again. He knew his mission he knew God's purposes, and he was willing to walk in those purposes come hatred or high water. The Bible says, be strong and take heart. Be on your guard, stand firm in the faith, be courageous, be strong, for the Lord your God goes with you, and he will never leave you nor forsake you. Jesus fearlessly spoke the truth. He was never a bully about it. He was never mean-spirited, but he courageously spoke the truth. He was also courageously silent in the face of his persecutors. Is he safe? No, he's not safe. But he's all-powerful, and he's always good. And then thirdly, Jesus was a man of endurance. I'm reminded of a few verses in the book of Hebrews. It says, Consider the one who endured great hostility from sinners so that you won't grow weary and lose heart in your struggle against sin. For you have yet to resist it to the point of shedding your blood. Jesus showed the vigor and the endurance of a perfect man. He was hated by sinners. He was persecuted to the point of death. He refused to strike back at them. He refused to abandon his dangerous mission. The opposition in his life rose higher and higher and higher. So the point that, that even one of his disciples betrayed him and the rest all fled from the garden. Why? Because they were big on promises and small on courage. And so they slipped away into the night. But when Jesus was in the desert for 40 days and he had no food, he had no water, and he lived off of every single word of God, he was courageous and he was brave and he was obedient. Even in that insufferable heat where his faithfulness was put to the test. And then when he was at his lowest, which is always the case, the devil snuck up behind him, the enemy of our souls, and tried to bring him down. You ever noticed how when you're at your weakest point, that's when the devil shows up in spades? That's what happened with Jesus. But Jesus knew his mission, and he knew his father's purposes, and he stuck it out to the very end, even to his own death on a cross at the hands of those cruel Romans. Because a perfect man knows why he's here. And he knows what his God-given mission is. And he endures. Do you? I was talking to a relative this week who's at really the very end of his rope. <clears throat> he's had a lot of bad things happen to him in the last few years. <clears throat> and he's made some not so helpful choices as well. And he's emotionally spent. He's had one thing after another go wrong for several years in his life. He's 
kind of given up on God for quite some time now. Because he doesn't understand or accept God's purposes for his life, he feels spent and defeated. Where Jesus could give him the strength to endure, he refuses to accept Christ's help. And he has no more endurance. He's at the end of his rope. And frankly, I'm a little bit worried about him. The Bible says, since we have a great high priest who has entered heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to what we believe. This high priest understands our weaknesses because he faced all of the same testings that we do, and yet he did not sin. So let us come boldly to the throne of grace where we will receive God's mercy and find grace and strength to help us in our own time of need. Jesus was a perfect man, powerful, courageous, a man of unending endurance. He was a man of conviction and self-control. A man who, who could have taken advantage of everybody, but who took advantage of nobody. He was a man of compassion, generosity, humility, and honesty. And I'll close with that last one. Jesus, in the glory of all of his perfection, was as faithful and honest as the day is long, and then some. He was faithful to God. He was faithful to God's purposes. He was faithful to us in his mission, and honest. Oh, my word, this man was honest. Any woman will tell you that this is the most important characteristic for her in the heart of a man. Honesty. He was honest with his mother. Woman, my time has not yet come. He was honest with his disciples. This path that I'm calling you to walk with me is not going to be easy. He was honest with the Pharisees. He was honest with unrepentant sinners. If you don't repent, you will all likewise perish, he said. He was honest about the future. He was honest about heaven and hell. He said that on that day, the Son of God will separate the sheep from the goats, and unbelievers will be cast into hell, but believers will have eternal life. He didn't pull punches. He was honest with people. And he showed the world what it means to truly be a man. He was honest. He was kind. He was gentle. He was powerful. He was brave. He showed us the pattern for all of humanity to live. Is he safe? Oh, no, my dear, he isn't safe. But he is powerful. And he is good. He was a man's man. From the crown of his head to the soles of his feet. He lived the most honest, the most noble, the strongest, the bravest, and most unselfish life that ever a man has lived. And he invites us into this same realm and this same adventure. Especially, guys, he's inviting us as men to be courageous and strong, to endure and also to have compassion and honesty and wrap all of that up with a heart of conviction and humility and love. Jesus is a man's man. And he's a lady's man in that sense of the word. The greatest man who will ever put on mortal flesh was the Son of God, the Son of Man. And Father, we thank you so much for the enduring example of your amazing Son. It's no wonder you adore him so much. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you came and you walked this mortal soil. And you lived out what it means to be a real man. I thank you that women felt safe in your presence. They felt loved. I thank you that men understood the adventure in your heart and the raw courage that you showed. And I thank you that you have modeled to us not only what it means to be the Son of God, but also to be the Son of Man. And Lord Jesus, I pray that you would imprint these characteristics upon our hearts, especially us guys who have so much to learn from you about being a real man. 
And so, Lord Jesus, thank you. Thank you for modeling real righteousness and real manhood to the rest of this world. Help us to walk in those steps. Help us to bring honor and glory to your name as we carry your name as believers in this world. Help us, Lord, to be, as guys especially, real men. A man's man. God's man. Someone, Father, that you are delighted in. Guide us in that, we pray. In Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. The love of God is greater far than tongue or pen can ever tell. It goes beyond the highest star and reaches to the lowest hell. The guilty pair bowed down with care. God gave his son to win. His erring child he reconciled then pardoned from his sin. When years of time shall pass away and earthly thrones and kingdoms fall, when men who hear refuse to pray on rocks and hills and mountains call, God's love so sure shall still endure all measureless and strong. Redeeming grace to Adam's race, the saints and angels song. O love of God, how rich and pure, how measureless and strong. It shall forevermore endure, the saints and angels song. Could we with ink the ocean fill, and were the skies of parchment made, for every stalk on earth a quail, and every man a scribe by trade, to write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry, nor could the scroll in the whole go stretch from sky to sky. O love of God, how rich and pure, how measureless and strong, it shall forevermore endure the saints and again today here online at Northwest Community Church in Meadow Lake, Saskatchewan. We miss gathering together as, uh, as a church family, but you know, that's about to change. With the new guidelines that the province has put out for us, we are prepared to reopen our services next Sunday, July the 5th at 1030, our usual time. It will be for worship only. It won't be for Sunday school hour, but we're just delighted that we can start to get together again. Our maximum seating capacity will be 60 people. So it's going to be very important for you to register your plan to attend every single week with your shepherding elder. They're going to be in touch with you, and they will need to hear from you every by, by every Thursday evening so that we will be able to accommodate you on Sunday morning and not have to turn you away. Uh, so please uh, 
be in cooperation with them every week in terms of registering your intent to be with us on Sunday mornings. Uh, they're also going to let you know what the guidelines are, including the social distancing rules, uh, the fact that we're going to have to wear masks when we sing, and the limits of our fellowship together. It's uh, certainly going to be different, but it's going to be great to be able to get together at least in this way. Uh, we want to keep everybody as safe as possible. We don't want to see some of those spikes that are starting to happen uh, south of our Canadian border as they've been getting together. And so uh, as long as we are practicing those things together, we're going to have a wonderful time of worship in the weeks and the months ahead. I want to thank Dwight Brooks for leading us in prayer and scripture reading this morning. I want to thank John's worship team for leading us in the musical worship, bringing our hearts in song before God. Uh, without these aspects of worship, it feels much less like a worship experience. So we look forward to seeing you next week here in person at our church building. And uh, uh, we're just really excited about the prospect of that being a long-term thing now and that we won't have to shut down once again down the road. For now, may the Lord bless you and may the Lord keep you. May the Lord's face shine upon you and be gracious to you. And may the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit.